The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to everyone here in the auditorium and the audience that's watching us on Zoom. I'm Professor John Jackson, and it's my pleasure to serve as the MC for today's event. Rear Admiral Chatfield is on international travel this week, but I'm pleased to welcome you on her behalf. The series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. It has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport and via Zoom around the world. We will be offering an additional 14 lectures between now and May of 2023, spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. Looking ahead on Tuesday, 25 October 2022, Professor Tim Hoyt will speak about the brutal conflict in Ukraine. This is a very timely discussion. I'm sure it will be of interest to all of our participants. So enough background and admin, let's proceed with the main event. Today's topic is very timely considering all that is going on in the areas of space engineering and exploration. Were it not for the recent hurricane, we might have seen the launch of the her huge NASA Artemis rocket carrying the Orion spacecraft on an uncrewed mission to the moon. We hope to see this launch sometime in November. NASA recently smashed a probe into a comet and SpaceX continues to launch rockets on a nearly weekly basis. And as a heads up on 15 November of this year, we will welcome NASA astronaut Sunny Williams to the college for an evening lecture about her upcoming flight to the International Space Station aboard Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. Like I said, there's a lot going on. Today's lecture on space and national security will survey how space is factored into U.S. national security from the days of Sputnik to the emerging era of great power competition. The presentation will describe potential threats and policy responses facing American sea space power today, and will discuss future challenges and possibilities ahead. Our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. David Burbach, is an associate professor in the National Security Affairs Department here at the Naval War College. He holds a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Bachelor of Arts in Government from Pomona College. He currently teaches U.S. foreign policy, international relations, and space security. His scholarly interest includes civil military relations, defense planning, and the relationship between international security and technology particularly with regard to space and nuclear issues. Before joining the Naval War College faculty in 2007, Professor Burbach taught at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies and worked for several analysis and information technology organizations in astronomy and space education. As a reminder, during the formal presentation, please submit any questions you have using the Zoom chat function, and we'll get to as many as possible at the end of the remarks. And following the conclusion of the remarks, we will have a family discussion group meeting where we'll provide some information of interest to the military folks here in the community. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Burbach, over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Professor Jack. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Professor Jackson, for that kind introduction. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone, to those of you with us here in person in Spruance, to the audience on Zoom and LinkedIn, and to the future, to anyone who may be watching this recording on YouTube uh, after the event. Um, I'm very pleased to have a chance to talk to you about space, which is, uh, you know, as Professor Jackson described, 
There's a lot going on. Um, and it's kind of interesting that we often think about space as representing the new, the new thing. But actually, it's very appropriate that this lecture happens to be today because today is the birthday of Sputnik. It was October 4th, 1957, that we humans first put something in orbit around the Earth when the Soviet Union launched a small satellite uh, that orbited for several months. Um, it's now far enough in the past that if Sputnik were still in orbit, it would be able to retire, collect Social Security, you know, move, move to Florida and relax. Um, so we've had satellites, you know, almost as long as we've had helicopters or ballpoint pens. Um, but there is still a lot of interesting new things going on in space. So what I'd like to do uh, in this talk today is give you a sense of some of the ways we use space for national security purposes during the Cold War, kind of the, the classic period of space. Talk about some of the ways that space security issues have changed since then. And you know why, other than just wow, cool new rockets, you know why some of our concerns about space on the military and security side have changed. What we're doing about those from change from creating space force to some of the diplomatic responses we might have, uh, and then talk a little, just a little bit about some of the changes in the commercial sector um, and some of what we've observed about how space has mattered in the war with Ukraine. So, like I said, we're you know 65 years ago, uh, the world was shocked. Um, when the when Sputnik was launched, and that kicked off the uh, what is probably the more familiar part of how space mattered to us in those early days was the public space race, um, the belief that space was critical for national prestige, that space technology was a way of demonstrating you know which superpower truly was going to own the future, who had the leading technology, whose whose economic system could really produce revolutionary events. Um, and it, it may be a little hard to read the cartoon on your upper right, um, but an editorial cartoon right after Sputnik shows, you know, Khrushchev trying to woo the lesser nations. We'd use a better phrase today, but Khrushchev trying to woo the lesser nations saying, who else can give you a moon while poor Uncle Sam stands there with a box of chocolates. Um, that's how we looked at it, that we, it was critical to show the world that we could compete. The Soviets managed to put the first person in space, uh, Yuri Gagarin in 1969. Um, we countered with John Glenn not too long after, just as an example of how this wasn't just about going into space, but part of this big, you know, we would now call it soft power or information operation. After Glenn's trip around the world, we sent, uh, we sent Glenn's capsule around the world again, not in space, but on ships and trucks. Um, to demonstrate in, in many countries, this particular long line is in India. It stopped in 30 different countries around the world because we wanted people to feel like it wasn't just America going into space, but that this was a grand adventure for the whole human race. And that culminated when we eventually landed on the moon. Uh, you see, uh, I, th I think that's Aldrin. I think Armstrong had the camera, so it's probably Aldrin uh, looking at the flag. Just as one example, you know, department store absolutely crowded with people at six in the morning in Sydney, Australia, people wanting to watch it. You know, in a time when television was really still pretty new, um, one in six people around the world found a way to watch it, you know, whether in a store, a big screen in a park, people, you know, some people at home. Um, this was a big deal. You know, we're very familiar with this story. Somewhat less well known is in some ways, the more important part of space back then and throughout much of the Cold War was not so public. We had a very important, very expensive secret space spy program. Um, we still do a lot of surveillance from space. It was even more secretive back then. And it can be hard to put ourselves in that mindset where today we're so used to being able to see anything in the world anytime we want. This is an example that was in the news last year where it turns out the Chinese have been building large mock-ups of American warships way out in their Western desert on railroad type tracks so they can move them um, at a missile test range. You know, pretty obvious what they're doing. They're practicing having missiles home in on moving US ships. We, you know, we've done tests like that too, but traditionally this would be the kind of thing that countries would really, really try to keep secret. They wouldn't want people to know that they were up to this. That's just not possible anymore. 
you know, this was in the newspapers, and this is not even from a government spy satellite. This image was taken by a commercial satellite. Any one of you if with a credit card, I'm not sure how much, you know, you're probably, you know, decently high limit. Any of you could go to the Maxar website and order images like this. You know, you could say, I want to pay for the satellite to take a photo of this spot, and they'll do it for you. Governments have even better capabilities. But when Sputnik went up, the world was a very different place. The Soviet Union was an extremely closed and secretive society. Um, you probably can't, you know, the, the map is a little dense here, but what this is, is an example of a captured German map that the Germans put together during their invasion of the Soviet Union, because captured maps from the Wehrmacht were actually better, the best we could do in many cases, because the Soviets, I mean, they literally would put towns in the wrong places on the maps that they were able to, willing to distribute publicly. We had no idea what was going on. So it became a critical priority to find out, you know, what sort of technology are they developing? How many bombers? How many missiles? Are there, are, are there forces getting ready to launch a surprise attack? And the way that we were able to do that was from space. So even before Sputnik was launched, we were working on our own space programs, much of it extremely secret. And we had already identified that putting sat spy satellites in orbit was a top national priority, that we needed to be able to have satellites seeing what was going on inside the Soviet Union. Now, we also tried things like the, you may have heard of the U-2 spy plane. Uh, you know, we, we violated Soviet territory and flew those for some years. Earlier, we even tried just putting cameras on balloons that we would let drift over the Soviet Union and they'd just take a picture of whatever happened to be below. Um, those were suboptimal. The balloons weren't very good. They shot down the U-2 spy plane. We realized space is going to be the way to do this. And within two years of Sputnik, we had functioning spy satellites in orbit. Um, and this became a tremendously important thing. We figured out very, very quickly the Soviets didn't have nearly as many missiles or bombers as we thought. You know, that's kind of a useful thing to know. You can be a little less afraid, maybe not spend so much money. And in fact, President Lyndon Johnson by the uh, late 60s told, uh, well, he, I, I'm not sure what he, you know, he, he apparently told a bunch of reporters, I don't want to be quoted on this. Well, of course, you know, they were reporters, so they quoted it. But Lyndon Johnson said, it'd be worth what we spent on space 10 times over because I know how many missiles the enemy has. I don't have to buy missiles that we don't need. I don't have to be afraid of a surprise attack. You know, I don't have to, to live in fear. Um, I know what the other side is up to, and that's worth a tremendous amount of money. So during the Cold War, you know, this surveillance use of space was absolutely critical, just as it continues to be critical today. And very early, we developed other military, we had other military uses uh, going on in space. We put a big priority, uh, in addition to the spy satellites to see what was going on, we developed satellites that could detect missile launches so that if the, you know, God forbid, if nuclear war were starting, we'd be able to see the missiles on their way as soon as possible to help avoid surprise attack. Um, you know, and other applications that we're used to today, like weather satellites, uh, the Navy had an early GPS, you know, uh, forerunner of GPS, a lot more complicated to use, but the Navy had a navigational system up by 1964, uh, weather, communications. So, you know, these, you know, going back to just the first decade of space, you know, we, we got a lot of military and national security utility out of it. Um, one thing I thought I'd mention that, you know, some of you may wonder is, you know, what about putting weapons in space. You know, it's a standard thing in science fiction movies, you know, you know, shoot down at the planets from space. Um, that really wasn't something that was that anybody was very seriously considered. We and the Soviets both thought about, well, we've put nuclear bombs everywhere else. Maybe we should put some nuclear bombs in space too. Um, as you think about that though, it means launching a nuclear weapon on a fairly, you know, what were then fairly unreliable rockets. You know, and that would be kind of an unfortunate launch accident. And once it's in orbit, the other country might destroy it, sabotage it, you know, take it over and bring it back to their country to inspect it. That, you know, it'd be kind of like if you just let a nuclear weapon go drifting around in the ocean. 
you know, where anybody could grab it. Um, so both countries figured out pretty quickly that there's just there wasn't a really good reason to put nukes in space, given that we already had ballistic missiles that could reach anywhere on Earth. Um, other, you know, people have also thought about, well, what if you have, you know, you know, imagine something like a telephone pole made out of a, you know, made out of tungsten or some heavy metal, and that comes screaming down from space and smashes into something. Um, theoretically possible, but it turns out it's it's not some kind of, you know, science fiction super weapon. You'll create a nice explosion, but you know, it's it's not different enough from a conventional explosion. It's you know hard to steer this metal telephone pole on its way down. So yeah, it turns out that that's really not a very attractive prospect. So there really hasn't been much effort to to put weapons in space to shoot down at Earth. There has, however, been a lot of interest going back to the very beginning of, of the space era to think about can we do something to shoot down satellites if we don't like what an adversary satellite is up to. And within just a couple of years after Sputnik, uh, the US had a very rudimentary anti-satellite system that relied on setting off nuclear weapons in space. Um, you, it's not surprising, but turns out a nuclear weapon can destroy a fragile little satellite pretty easily. Uh, you know, you, the uh, photo in the lower left there is a test of an anti-satellite weapon in space uh, about a, about 800 miles away from Hawaii that's looking from Honolulu. Uh, yeah, it turns out that that has some bad side effects. Um, radiation gets trapped in space and will affect other satellites. That test you see there destroyed AT&T's first television satellite. They put up the first television relay satellite just a few weeks earlier. And we in AT&T tried not to talk about it too much at the time, but it turns out we fried that first television satellite with our nuclear test and a couple other of our satellites and a couple Soviet satellites. Um, so that, that, you know, it's a, it's something you could do. Nobody was really eager to go that route because it would make space unusable for everybody pretty quickly. Likewise, and here the, I've got a frame from the uh, movie Gravity that came out, God, that's probably getting towards 10 years ago now, um, with the Kessler syndrome. And if you destroy a satellite, it'll break into thousands of pieces that'll hit other satellites and so on and so on. Yeah, so you know, both, both the US and the Soviets realized you can you could build anti-satellite weapons, but if you actually use them, you can, you know, space may be big, but you can actually contaminate space with radiation and debris pretty quickly. So during the Cold War, we both developed the technology for anti-satellite weapons, um, but relative to how much money we might have put into them, how we might have deployed, you know, whole fleets of anti-satellite missiles. Both countries were relatively restrained. We kind of realized we've got nuclear deterrence. In fact, having missile warning systems and other nuclear surveillance in space provides some stability. If you blow up the other side's missile warning satellites, they're probably going to assume you're about to launch a first strike at them. Why else would you blow up the missile warning satellites? Um, so there was a, a relative amount of restraint um, you know, we, we certainly competed to be better at spying, you know, than the other side or, you know, figuring out what, you know, try to figure out what the other side was up to, but, you know, space didn't become as, as much of a battleground as many people feared it might. Well, what's different today? And, you know, what has changed over the years is how much space has become integrated in everything. You know, if in the, in the 1970s, space was absolutely critical for nuclear deterrence, you know, knowing where targets were, communicating, missile warning. Um, you know, but for the, you know, day, you know, even in, for the military, the average service member and their daily job, you know, probably wasn't interacting with space technology very much. The average citizen, you know, they, you'd see some fairly low quality satellite weather photos on the, you know, when you tuned into the local news at six o'clock. Um, that's all different. Everybody in this room probably has a smartphone and that relies on GPS signals from space. Uh, your phone probably can use signal, you know, probably can also use the Russian Galileo system, might use the Chinese Baidao system. You know, there are now several different of these navigational systems that not only are critical so you know where you are, a little more, you know, a little more down in the, the nerdy weeds, um, but timing signals from GPS are critical so that cell stations can keep track of, hey, when did this bit of data arrive? When did that bit of data arrive? Um, timing from GPS and similar systems turns out to be critical. Now, 
what military or civilian communications, you know, television, uh, you know, I've got a, a standard sort of DOD issue, you know, overly complicated chart of, you know, how to build a whole, you know, space-based ISR architecture. We use space for everything. You know, we have used, you know, satellites in space to track terrorist cell phone signals to direct GPS guided munitions onto them. Um, so with space and absolutely everything, it means that everything is dependent on space. And taking away space capabilities has the potential to have huge military implications, you know, or civilian implications. Take away GPS and the civilian economy takes a big hit. So you combine that space dependence with return, a return to great power competition. And with the case of Russia and China, unlike adversaries like the Taliban or even Serbia or Iraq, Russia and China are spacefaring powers. They've got space technology. They also have systems like ours, and they have what we call counter space systems, ways to attack our space systems, anti-satellite weapons, uh, cyber and electronic weapons. And there's a fear that we're probably even more vulnerable uh, than, than they are, given that the US and our allies tend to be so technologically dependent. You know, We have more of this built in, our economies depend more on the kind of capabilities uh, you know, that space enables. Geography also matters. If we were to be, in, be involved in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Straits, um, you know, think about what a relatively short distance that is for China. They can use fiber optic cables to their coast and then you know, might be as little as 100 miles uh, to where they're operating. Whereas we're on literally the opposite side of the planet from US headquarters or even from Pearl Harbor, we would absolutely be depending on space-based communication, space-based ISR, space-based navigation. So if you take space away from everybody, that's probably a relative advantage to China. You know, Russia, not entirely, you know, less so, but not entirely. So there's a lot of concern about these countries might feel like there would be an advantage. There'd be value in attacking US systems. Um, and there are a couple of ways they might do that today. Um, you know, just as in the early Cold War, we had some very rudimentary anti-satellite weapons, technology's gotten better. And both China and Russia have anti-satellite weapons that will intercept and destroy a satellite without a nuclear weapon, smashing into it, creating a lot of debris, but pretty effective. Uh, the Russians tested one of these systems uh, about two, uh, almost three years ago now, um, caused a lot of debris, in fact, debris that threatened their own astronauts on the International Space Station, um, but the system clearly works. Um, so if, they, if Russia or China wanted to start shooting down US satellites, they'd have the ability to do that. Um, even more attractive these days are the possibilities of electronic or cyber warfare. If you can blind a satellite, you know, by overpowering its radio receivers, um, and the U.S. Oh, actually, I sorry, I probably let me. Uh, I should have advanced the slide, but I realized I skipped. I skipped actually one of the more cool points on this slide uh, was, you know, not before we do EW and jamming. Um, we have the technology now to rendezvous when space. You know, just like how the space shuttle would pull up to the Hubble Space Telescope, but well, we can now do that robotically. So if I have a little satellite you know, come close to your, let's say your spy satellite that I want to disable, I can pull up to it and out comes a giant pair of robot scissors and I snip off your solar panels. Well, your satellite doesn't work and there isn't much debris. Or I have, I mean, as ludicrous as it sounds, this would work, I just spray paint the lens of your giant spy satellite. You um, can't see anything now or a beam of microwaves that causes, you know, same like if you put a, you know, same thing like if you put a compact disc, does anybody still know what a compact disc is? If you put, you know, those, you know, compact disc in a microwave, it makes, you know, impressive little lightning, you know, out of it. Yeah, you, know, you could, there are ways you could shoot microwaves from a short distance that would be able to destroy a satellite, render it inoperable without creating debris clouds. Or even more so in that direction, um, radio jamming, laser blinding, or cyber attacks. The US acknowledges that we do have a radio jamming capability. You know, we, we've admitted this in public, uh, that we'd be able to overload an adversary communication satellite and render it inoperable while we're jamming it. Um, we're quite sure the Russians and the Chinese have similar systems. 
We say the Russians and the Chinese both have systems that can shoot lasers to temporarily blind spy satellites as they're passing overhead. Um, and nobody admits, of course, to any cyber capabilities, but we know they're out there. So as I'll talk about in a minute, um, Russia actually used a cyber attack against a space system in the Ukraine war. But you know, one assumes that you know, the Russians, the Chinese, us, anybody else um, is working on cyber capabilities, which again, you know, could be used without creating all of this debris, without making space unusable as we worry about. So what could the U.S. do about this? I'm not going to go through these in detail. If you, for those of you who are NWC students, if you want to take my space, my space elective, you know, we'll talk more about strategy and diplomacy. Um, but there are a number of things that the U.S. is is thinking about how, you know, could we do this? One is simply make ourselves, our space systems more difficult to attack. Um, make our satellites less fragile. Um, you could even potentially put defensive systems. So if you see, you know, if that, you know, the spacecraft with the giant pruning shears is coming at you, maybe you've got a short range, you know, interceptor that you could fire at it as it approaches. You know, you could have kind of a cool James Bond arms race and that kind of stuff with the satellites. Um, even easier, just put up a lot more satellites. You know, instead of having 10 or 20 satellites that provide a given capability, if you have thousands that provide that capability together, that's a lot of targets that need to be hit. And so that kind of redundancy is something we're thinking about. Um, we can also rely on deterrence. And you know, we, we have made clear that, you know, in fact, uh, also NATO has now said that an attack on NATO country space systems counts as an Article 5 you know, uh, incident, perhaps. You can tell other countries, if you attack our space systems, we'll attack yours. Or even that if you attack our space systems, we'll attack something you care about on the ground. Blow up our missile warning satellites and we'll blow up you know, one of your missile launch facilities or, or something. Um, you know, we could, you know, it, 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 you know back in, in, the, in the heady days after the Cold War when, you know, we had the unipolar moment, some people said, hey, the U.S. has an opportunity now to race ahead, weaponize space, and basically just shoot down anything any other country ever launches if they don't agree to do it by our rules. Uh, that day has probably passed, and that, that, that really wasn't kind of how we were thinking about international relations. But, you know, there's still a possibility that we could really kind of move into an, a more of an offensive counter space orientation. Or going the other direction, maybe we could pursue some space arms control. And we, we certainly, we have been trying to at least get other countries to stop doing destructive weapons tests. We, we have pledged we will not test an anti-satellite weapon that causes debris in space the way Russia and China have done. And we've done in the past too, you know, a pretty distant past, but you know, we've said unilaterally, we're just not gonna do it even if they keep testing. Um, and we would like to get other countries to stop that as well. So there, there are a variety of things that, uh, you know, that, uh, of strategic responses that we might have. We have also had a major organizational response. Um, because of these concerns that we had these space vulnerabilities that weren't being adequately addressed, um, we created the Space Force. Uh, those of you who are students, will you will have a lesson on the creation of Space Force in the National Security Affairs Department when, either, uh, when, when you get to that part of the course. Um, and it's easy to say, us, oh, we have Space Force because Donald Trump thought Space Force was cool. Um, yeah, that's actually part of the reason. Um, but even without Donald Trump, there actually was, even in the late Obama administration, talk about how we needed to reorganize to put more focus on space and deal with these rising challenges. Um, you know, I won't go into too much more detail there. Uh, any, if any of you are familiar enough with Space Force to know the current chief of space operations is John Raymond, and that's not his photo. Uh, the Senate just confirmed the second chief of space operations. Hasn't had the change of command yet, but General Salzman will be, uh, will be coming in to take command you know, sometime in the, the next several weeks. What is Space Force going to do? Um, they're not going to be flying X-wing fighters. Um, they're not going to be shooting lasers at anyone. They're not going to have space Marines. I don't doubt the Marines will at some point insist we need an independent space capability because that's kind of how the Marine Corps thinks. Um, but Space Force is not going to have space Marines. They won't even have astronauts. What Space Force is going to be about is defending and operating satellites, mostly. 
Um, they're going to be in charge of keeping these, of operating our space capabilities, protecting our space capabilities. And if we choose to develop offensive counter space capabilities of our own, they would be the ones who would use that. Um, so they're going to be in charge of knowing what's going on in space. Uh, they're going to be in charge of, you know, of figuring out how to protect our satellites. Um, and more at kind of more of the, the program management and acquisition level, Space Force is supposed to figure out how do we build this stuff faster, better, cheaper? Because uh, one of the, and you'll, those of you who are students, this is actually where some of the, the meat of the lesson will go. Um, space had be, you know, we are used to delays and cost overruns in military procurement. Space systems had been especially bad um, with some very long delays and lack of coordination. Um, we had new GPS satellites up several years before the ground terminals had been built and distributed because the Air Force and Army got out of sync on that. So we literally had signals that nobody had the capability to use because we hadn't distributed the ground equipment yet. Um, Space Force is supposed to pull this together and figure that stuff out. We don't know if that's going to work yet. It's still too new. But but what Congress really hopes is that Space Force is able to get us more innovation, lower cost, more synergy between with everything we're doing in space. Now, at the same time, as uh, as Professor Jackson alluded to, there's a lot of cool new stuff going on commercially. Rockets may not be new. But having competition among multiple private companies for who's got the best rocket, that actually is pretty new. Um, even if co companies like Boeing and Lockheed used to build, you know, build rockets, they were on government contracts. You now have companies not only like SpaceX. The, uh, the rocket you see in the top left there uh, is from a company called Rocket Lab that has launched out of New Zealand. Just this weekend, a company called Firefly got its first rocket into orbit. Uh, SpaceX will have the next commercial flight to the uh, International Space Station tomorrow. Um, so there's a lot going on in the launch field, but there's also a lot going on with satellites um, and software. And, and in some ways, that's actually where the even more interesting action is. Um, you now have commercial capabilities like that photo of the, the uh, warship mock-up in the Chinese desert. Um, you, tremendous ISR capabilities from commercial constellations. Not only optical sensing, there are networks of uh, what's called synthetic aperture radar, radar imaging that'll work at night and through clouds that provides absolutely militarily useful level capabilities in, you know, available. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long it is from like when, when they would provide, take an image to when you'd have it, but short enough time to be tactically useful at a commercial level, even commercial ELINT and SIGINT type satellites. Like, you know, there are now commercial firms that have, you know, ELINT systems to triangulate, you know, to like help keep track of where ships are on the ocean. So commercial companies are developing capabilities that used to be almost exclusively government and developing them sometimes in very large numbers. Um, I, if uh, for, for any of you who have kids, please in the next couple of years, take your kids outside, look at the stars, enjoy the night sky. Because in another 10 years, it's going to look like you live right off the runway at LAX. Uh, the number of satellites in orbit is set to possibly increase at least by 10, maybe 100. Uh, I, I like to do, try doing a, you know, a strong photography at night, astrophotography as it's called. Uh, in some of my images just a couple of weeks ago, there were as many as a dozen satellites visible in every single frame that I took near sunrise or sunset. Um, that's kind of, I'll admit, that's kind of a weird niche interest. So, you know, don't let me stand in the way of progress. Um, what this means is that you're going to be able to get, it's going to be like Wi-Fi from space, broadband from space, constellations of many, many thousands of satellites from different providers. SpaceX is out in the lead, but they're not the only one. Um, and so there's a lot happening with, with commercial players here in the US, in Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know, all over you know, the Middle East, uh, UAE uh, has a lot, is very interested in developing commercial space. So there's a lot going on in that sector. And you can see this come together, some of these security concerns and the commercial revolution in Ukraine, uh, you know, and I think the, this is from uh, India today, uh, you know, headline that kind of captured it there from early in the war, you know, Ukraine sends SOS to Elon Musk. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, I'll say a little, 
Well, let me uh, let me move on and say where where this came from. Uh, I'll go backwards there. One of the very first shots that Russia fired in this war was a space a cyber attack on a space system. The Ukrainian military had made heavy use of a satellite communication system called Viasat uh, for voice communication. They have a pretty cool artillery system. It's almost you know they people have called it Uber for artillery. Uh, you know, a very distributed where kind of people identify targets and then artillery units kind of say, I can serve that target, um, cell phone based. They need to move data for that. And, you know, a lot of that moved over a network called Viasat. First hour of the war, Russia launched a cyber attack, not against the satellites, but against the ground terminals. It essentially told the Viasat servers, um, here's some new, the new software update for the terminals pushed it out to the terminals, and it rendered the terminals dead, unusable, unfi you know, unfixable um, for both the Ukrainians and for thousands of commercial users in Europe, in NATO countries. So NATO countries actually suffered millions of dollars worth of property damage uh, out of this attack, which is kind of interesting. Um, pretty, And that's what led to Ukraine calling on SpaceX, hey, can you help us out? Um, and SpaceX, with funding from the U.S. government, has provided a lot of terminals, uh, satellite capability, and because they have so many satellites, they don't have 100,000 yet, but they do have 2,500 in orbit, Russia probably has a few dozen, at most, anti-satellite interceptors. So you reduce 2,500 to, say, 2,450, and you really haven't slowed SpaceX down that much. They launch 50 satellites every week. Um, you know, it's not worth it to try and shoot it. They've tried cyber attacks and so far have failed. Um, you know, they, they might, you know, maybe they'll figure something out. Um, but this is where that revolution and this massive commercial capability has enabled Ukraine to, uh, you know, to survive that loss of capability. Or on the commercial side too, this is from the, just before the war began, a uh, commercial radar satellite showing vehicle columns forming up. This is at almost midnight local time. Uh, the Ukrainians have been getting you know, uh, imagery, radar imagery. Um, the U.S. has provided assistance uh, you know, in how to analyze and interpret and make use of satellite data. Um, so this commercial capability has been pretty helpful uh, to Ukraine. And so just some, you know, a few thoughts on what I think we've seen from the war so far. There were, if you'd gone back before the war, you know, many analysts said, you know, probably cyber or jamming is going to be a lot more attractive than blowing up satellites. And that's exactly what we've seen. Um, and in fact, you know, it, had it not been for, for Starlink, the Russian cyber attack on Ukraine's, you know, on the commercial space systems that Ukraine used might have made a real difference uh, in the war. That might have been a pretty big hit. Um, it absolutely shows the value of redundancy. You know, Russia hasn't bothered to try and affect, do anything against the SpaceX satellites. You know, they've, they've, you know, there are 2,500 of them. What are you going to do? You know, nobody has that many anti-satellite uh, missiles. Um, you know, that sharing intelligence and communication data can be very valuable. That commercial companies, as I've said, can provide militarily useful equipment. It also raises a question that, that I don't think policymakers have really thought through fully yet. It makes commercial, uh, the commercial sector a target. In fact, the uh, head of the Russian space agency implied that Elon Musk personally could be considered a military target, uh, you know, given how involved he'd become. But certainly, you know, by international law, if, if whether it's Viasat or SpaceX, if they're providing tactical, you know, direct you know, military relevant service, legitimate targets. So what would the U.S. do if the Russians or the Chinese did start blowing up commercial satellites that belong to a U.S. company? Or what if they belong to a country that doesn't have, you know, space military, you know, a, a NATO member that doesn't have space capabilities of its own other than, you know, owning a satellite company? Uh, I don't think, I don't know that we fully thought that through yet of what level of protection are we willing to provide? Should our military cyber people be talking to the space companies about you know, potential threats and how to fix them. Um, it may even go the other direction. Apparently, our cyber people have been really impressed at what SpaceX has been able to do to fend off Russian attacks. Um, but it does suggest that you know, the, there's, there's, there's more connection between the commercial and the military uh, you know, than either side had sort of really thought through. So we'll, we'll see what comes out of the policy there. 
Um, I did want to end on a happier note before we move to Q&A, though, kind of the, the other cool thing that's happening uh, that hopefully doesn't have a lot of military connection yet is the, the rise of commercial space travel. Uh, this is, you know, the Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin spacecraft, a suborbital rocket, similar, in fact, you know, to give give credit where due to an alumni, similar to uh, what Alan she uh, Alan Shepard, the uh, first man to ride an American rocket on a suborbital flight, graduate of the Naval War College. Um, you know, we in fact Navy leads the number of the number of people who've walked on the moon. Navy is is definitely ahead of Air Force on that. You know, we we've done we've done pretty well. Al, Alan Shepard, similar to Alan Shepard's flight, uh, except William Shatner, TV's Captain Kirk, um, a fully private mission of uh, you know civilians in the space into orbit on a SpaceX capsule, and. As uh, as John described, what uh, what you should keep an eye on in the news in the next few weeks, um, if you weren't aware of it, we want to go back to the moon. You know, it's uh, it's been fifty, you know, more than fifty years. Seems like it's reasonable to visit again. Uh, but in the next couple of weeks, NASA hopes to launch the first test flight of this new rocket. If you uh, those of you who are interested in space may notice. You know, it has some similar, you know, kind of same color, same side rockets as the space shuttle. That's exactly right. It reuses some space shuttle technology. Uh, we hope to do a first uncrewed test flight to the moon in the next few weeks. And then probably in about three to four years uh, to actually land on the moon using this gigantic lander uh, that SpaceX is developing for NASA. Um, but there's a, there's a security connection here too. Um, where for Apollo, when we went to the moon the first time, it was all about the U.S. demonstrating what the U.S. could do. Um, we want to do that again. We'd really like to get to the moon before the Chinese get to the moon for the first time. But we're doing it in a way that really emphasizes partnerships. Um, we, we have, we've already made agreements with a number of countries to like the, uh, the, the Canadians will include a rope, you know, the Canadians specialize in building robot arms, you know, like they first did for the space shuttle. There's going to be a Canadian robot arm, uh, included as part of one of the missions. Um, Japan is going to contribute a rover built by Toyota. Uh, for one of the missions. The European Space Agency is contributing a small space station that'll be in lunar orbit. We're really, what we're doing in Artemis is really the work, you know, trying to bind out, you know, saying, come join us, you know, do this really cool thing with us. You know, your cynical view, your, your people, your voters back home will think it's really cool when a Canadian or a Japanese astronaut sets foot on the moon. You know, you're, you know, joining with us in our view of an, you know, how, of an open, you know, our vision of a liberal rules-based order in space. So we're trying to leverage this to, to get countries and countries that are not, you know, cl as close an ally as say Canada or Japan. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is uh, participating uh, at some level. So we're, we're trying to, you know, in a slightly different way than Apollo, there's definitely some diplomatic goals that we have that we're trying to, you know, build a coalition that's working together with us in the same way that China is now taking on Russia as a junior partner for their lunar exploration plans. Well, let me, uh, I want to allow time for Q&A and, and for the uh, family discussion group. So let me bring it to a close there. I'd be happy to take questions here in the room, or uh, I assume the, the booth can pass on questions from Zoom or, or however we're going to work that. Uh, so would you like? That is just uh, way cool stuff. Uh, does anyone here in the auditorium have a question? If so, use your microphone that's attached to the, uh, the seat in front of you. Any questions here internally? Okay, Gary, do we have anything from the Zoom audience? Uh, we do, uh, and thank you for the remarks, uh, Professor Burbach. Uh, the first question that came in uh, was about um, Elon Musk's Starlink system and and just putting up a lot of numbers. So is that really the the solution uh, to to you know um, counter um, China and Russia? Uh, and and do we? But is there is there also like the 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 backside that we increase the congestion up in space with the number of operational satellites? 
yes to both parts of that. Um, it's, I, I think, you know, if, if you went back 10, 20 years, um, the thinking would be nobody can make satellites cheap enough that you could put up thousands of them. So we erred on the side of building a very small number of incredibly capable, super expensive satellites. Um, SpaceX, you know, they, they figured out how to do some amazing stuff. I actually, just a few weeks ago, was at an event and talked to uh, a woman who had, she was the manager for the solar panels on the Starlink satellites. First of all, one way that it's different than how we do things in DOD or Boeing, she was in charge of the solar panels on the satellite, and I think she was 26 years old. Um, you know, mid twenties, uh, you, you, and you know, there weren't a whole, there wasn't a whole lot of management between her and Elon, uh, you know, really Glenn Shotwell, the CEO of SpaceX. Um, and they tried things like, instead of using space qualified solar panels, they said, well, if we're launching a lot of them, they don't have to be perfect. They literally like went to Home Depot or REI or something and bought the same kind of solar panels that you would take camping and found that they were almost as good as the space qualified and like 99% cheaper. So they went with that. And if a couple of satellites don't work, well, launch 50 a week, you can afford to lose a few. Just I, you imagine traditional aerospace, you know, program people just, you know, their heads exploding at that. Um, so now that we've just figured out you actually can make satellites small and cheap and an assembly line way. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the thinking that we've long had that satellites are these very fragile, very small in number items. So if anybody starts attacking them, your space capability goes away fast. Large constellations really seem to help with that problem. You know, and the Russians, you know, they, they kind of say, yeah, we're kind of confounded. How, you know, you can't, you know, wouldn't be worth it to attack these satellites. Uh, the questioner is exactly right, though. You know, my, my little graph with the 100,000 satellites, um, it raises the possibility that these satellites are going to collide with each other. Um, you know, the number, I mean, it, they're already, you know, there, there's a whole, like, I only re came to realize this a couple of years ago. There are private companies that have giant tracking radars just to help companies not have their satellites smash into other satellites. Um, this is going to become a more and more difficult problem. Again, I kind of, you know, selfishly, I focus on the, you know, the night sky is going to be full of these things when you look up. But more seriously, yeah, we we need some rules on traffic management. Um, in the U.S., we just, uh, the Federal Communications Commission just announced they're making stricter rules on how you have to plan to deorbit and get rid of a satellite when it has stopped working. Um, you know, worldwide, those rules aren't really in place. Uh, if you, uh, you know, you may have seen a couple times in the last few years, uh, China has launched one of their largest rockets. The boost this booster stage from that, most countries at this point, they have little thrusters. They can do a controlled entry of the big booster into the ocean somewhere. China does not. They let it fall wherever it's going to fall. And there have been, there was debris that came down close to some West African villages about four or five years ago. You know, there on that particular one, its orbit actually passed right over Rhode Island before it got to, you know, five minutes earlier, and we would have had to think about it. So there's a lot of room for, for global regulation here. And at the very least, I, I'd hope to see the U.S. impose more. But yeah, that's, you know, on the, from the, you know, standpoint of, if any, if any, if anybody, you know, for the, uh, I, I know I've got one of my faculty colleagues is in the room, so I know he'll he's get it. We worried about space being very offense dominant, you know, one, whoever shot first would win. When you've got 100,000 satellites, it's a little harder to pull that off. So it does change some of that thinking about how delicate the, the, the military balance might be in space. Oh, thank you, Pro Professor Burbach. Uh, the second question that came in, um, now that there's like uh, interest in in going to the moon, uh, is there is there then the follow up interest in in putting up satellites around the moon? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, NASA, the NASA plan, it, and it's it's a let me back up one. What I don't show here, you know, here. This is the big on the left. The, uh, the the orange rocket is what's going to carry the astronauts to the moon in a tiny little capsule on top. Um, 
On the right is the SpaceX Starship lander that will meet it near the moon and then land on the moon. What you don't see here is we plan, and there's an intermediate step. We're actually planning, and I think the Europeans are building most of it, a small space station that'll orbit the moon. So we'll actually have the astronauts go into lunar orbit in this small space station, go down to the moon from there, come back. Um, there are people who think it's kind of a little convoluted and it's kind of an excuse to have more stuff to build, you know, to you know, have more contractors involved. Uh, it gets beyond my kind of systems engineering knowledge to know if it's a good idea or not. Um, but it also means we probably will put little relay satellites. In fact, the Chinese currently have, they have a rover on the far side of the moon. That can't communicate with Earth because the whole moon is blocking its radio signals. The Chinese have a relay satellite in a distant orbit over the moon that can relay its communications back to Earth. Um, you know, in in one thing that that you know that with that kind of a, a common problem with space when countries don't trust each other, uh, so many technologies are dual use. I mean, rockets. You know, SpaceX uses the same rockets for the astronauts or to launch military satellites. Um, we have raised concerns that that Chinese relay satellite. At the very least, that same technology, maybe the Chinese want to like put a spy satellite in way out past the moon, or they could relay, you know, they could, you know, as a backup for their Earth based communication satellites, they could have a distant like nuclear command and control satellite past the moon. Even I've seen even a few anonymous quotes from some Air Force intelligence offices saying, oh, you know, maybe the whole rover is kind of a covert weapons test and the science mission is just a cover story. I don't buy that. I mean, I, I know scientists who have been involved with the Chinese on it. I mean, the things like, you know, microwave oven size. Um, but when countries don't trust each other and when it's hard to know what's going on in space, um, anything, you know, like I, I am slightly surprised the Chinese didn't raise the concern with our the asteroid smashing test we just did. The, the technology to have the NASA spacecraft hit that tiny asteroid is very similar to the technology that an interceptor would use to home in on a ballistic missile. Um, you know, the Chinese might have said, ah, this is just an excuse to practice that technology. If the Chinese had done that mission, we might have said that about them. And, you know, in some cases, we're right to be suspicious like that. So, you know, uh, I'm kind of off the, the moon satellite subject, but that is actually, you know, we, we are feeling kind of wary about, Hey, or does you know, with China wants to do stuff around the moon, is that really just because they're interested in moon science, or do they see some potential strategic uses of being able to operate satellites out there? Um, you know, so uh, you know, geopolitical tension spills into space. Jerry, let me throw a question out if I could. Hmm? Uh, just talk about reusability. Mm -hmm how SpaceX has really revolutionized rocketry by being able to use those spacecraft, those rockets over and over again. The Artemis will be used once and it'll fall in the ocean and it's done. The SpaceX model is totally different. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the importance of that sure. reusability? Yeah, the uh, the SpaceX, the, the rocket they're using now, the Falcon 9 is the one you've probably seen video footage of this, you know, like the science fiction movies used to show this, you know, thing comes down and lands vertically on its rocket plume. Um, they, I think on their most recent launch, the booster that they used had flown 13 times. Um, and one thing that's changing in a paradigm is in space, we, we tended to think, well, geez, you know, rockets are so fragile, like, okay, maybe it made it up once and came back, but yeah, I don't want my valuable satellite because, you know, wh what if that weld that's going to go goes on flight number two? They've actually developed such a reliability record that people are starting to look at it the other way around. And the uh, NASA's top science guy actually said, I now want my missions to launch on a previously flown booster because I think the probability of discovering a defect when it blows up on the first flight is higher than the probability that something is fatigued and breaks on the second or third or fourth flight. Um, that's a very different way of looking at things. So that, and this, you know, this has been the holy grail for a long time. We thought the space shuttle was going to provide cheap access to space because you, you wouldn't throw everything away. Turned out we actually you threw away most of it on every launch, actually. We made a lot of compromises in the space shuttle design. And it turned out simply that it's so difficult to keep people alive in space. 
Um, and the other thing in here, here, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of riffing in a slightly different direction, but the importance of things like kind of culture and, you know, who dominates an agency. Um, the big problem with the space shuttle is that it had wings and landed at a runway. And making something that'll both fly in space and be able to maneuver and fly like an airplane, you know, supersonic, subsonic flight on Earth, like it's a lot of weight to lift landing gear up to space and back that, you know, you really only need in those last few seconds. But if you look back at kind of the talk back then, you know, all the astronauts, you know, most of the NASA people had an aviation background. You see, talk about how undignified it was to come down in a capsule and splash down in the ocean. And everyone was like, oh God, finally we're going to land like real pilots. You know, we're going to come down on a runway. This will be a real spacecraft, not a freaking capsule. Um, well, it turns out the capsule, if all you want to do is get people up and back, the capsule approach is a lot more efficient than an airplane that also goes in space. Um, and, you know, space shuttle could do a lot of things that we didn't really need it to do. So by, and, Kind of the, the, the thing that SpaceX did, we also thought, well, landing a rocket on its, on its tail, on its engine, uh, no, nobody could, you know, no pilot could handle that. Well, it turns out computers are not good enough to do that. I mean, it's a really finicky, un, you know, wings have the advantage of being reasonably stable. Um, you know, landing a rocket, you know, holding itself up, you know, on its plume. That's really finicky, but it turns out that computers, uh, machine vision, GPS guidance, we can do that now. Um, we There were some early tests in the 1990s. Um, people still thought winged airplane-like vehicles were the way to go for the future. Um, to Musk's credit, he kind of, he was one of the people who saw those 1990s demonstrations, thought, nah, this is the way to go. This is how we're going to do it. And, you know, it turned out to be a bet that paid off. Gary, do you have any other questions for us? Uh, just one other uh, question. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit about the success um, or 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 not so with hacking the Starlink system? Um, I think that there's been reports, perhaps like in Ukraine, that, that this has happened, as well as like, is China interested in doing that uh, for um, low Earth orbit satellite networks? Uh I'll take the second part first. Yes. In fact, China has, you know, Chinese military, there was, I don't know the journal, but, you know, Chinese military newspaper, you know, in fact, had an article saying, hey, given what we're seeing in Russia, yeah, we, we need to develop ways specifically to take out Starlink um, if we get in a conflict with the Americans or some other or an ally who's using it. So the Chinese have definitely said, hey, this is an issue. We, we need to be ready to take, you know, just because it's commercial and not military, you know, no, it's a legitimate target if it's being used by a military. Um, on hacking, I don't, you know, I, I, I have no doubt there are a lot of attempts to hack it. Um, my, from what I've understood so far, SpaceX has at least mostly been winning that fight. Um, in fact, even again, early on in the spring, I know our cyber command people were saying, they were kind of, they were amazed at you know how the the cycle the, the the rapidity of the cycle which they could develop and get a patch up was very impressive compared to what we were able to do. Um, I don't doubt that there's hacking. I don't I don't have a yeah here was this hack and it was successful story. I'm also not going to claim that I've seen every possible claim about that. Um, it hasn't been you know it's still working. So there hasn't been a hack that's like taken the system down. Um, but uh, but I it's I mean if I were the Russians, it would certainly be a huge target as far as I'm concerned. One more question, mm -hmm. a final question here in the audience. Good evening, Lefin Gomad and Nitin, India. Uh, I've got two questions. First is regarding ASAT capability against geosynchronous satellites, geosynchronous or geostationary. We have evidence suggesting that against LEO and MEO, uh, the kinetic ASAT capability has been proven. But uh, for a geosynchronous satellite, there is nothing concrete uh, which says that, yes, there has been an attempt and it has been successful. So, so this, my question is, uh, are there ASAT capabilities against geosynchronous satellites? Okay. Yes, uh, we've seen the maneuverable satellites which are approaching and other things, but kinetic ASAT capability against geosynchronous satellites. Is there a likelihood of its development or is it already in uh, place? Uh, Second, oh, yeah. 
uh, second one is about uh, moon earth uh, exploration zone uh, so the chinese doctrine says about moon earth exploration zone uh, how do you see it whether it will be a commercial uh, activity or will it be a government activity and what is the way us is thinking about a uh, similar thing okay uh, on the first part yeah the most of the anti satellite weapons that have been tested are against satellites in relatively low earth orbit not all the way out at geosynchronous orbit 23000 miles where you've got you need more velocity to get out there um i don't know of any you know of these direct ascent weapons um i don't believe any country has done a test all the way out to geo i know china has done that they have not done a test where they've destroyed a satellite at higher altitudes. They've done some tests that we're pretty sure are tests where you know they know what point they're aiming for in space, so it's kind of a simulated test. We're pretty sure that they have worked on, and I don't know if any have been all the way to geo particularly, so I, I know the Chinese have been interested. I don't know of a Russian system that reaches geo. Um, and, a somewhat, and getting there kind of direct from, from Earth is tough. There have also been systems that I think you mentioned where you would put a satellite in geosynchronous orbit and then gradually approach. In fact, even the possibility of essentially a space mine, you could put it there and just let it sit for months or years and maneuver it. That's actually something I know we we worry about because you know it, if, it, if it's small and doesn't do anything to draw attention to itself, you might lose track of it until it actually matters. So that's one of the reasons uh, Space Force is putting a lot of emphasis on what we call space domain awareness, knowing what's going on. And, you know, even all the way out to the moon on the for the the, the moon question. Um, yeah, you know, the moon, the moon, uh, by international law, anybody's free to go anywhere on the moon. Um, nobody can claim the moon as territory that they own. Um, but we also agree in internet, everyone agrees in the Outer Space Treaty to not inter harmfully interfere with other countries' actions. Well, what if China says, and this actually came up in the comedy show Space Force on Netflix. Um, it was one of the few things where like, hey, that actually, you know, that they hit on a real issue there. What if China lands at like the most, in, you know, there, there are a few craters near the South Pole that probably have ice in craters where it's shadowed permanently because it's at the pole. What if China lands at the most interesting crater and says, you will interfere with our science mission if you visit anywhere near this crater? Um, and it's where we wanted to explore too. And the Chinese say, you got to stay 100 miles away from us. Um, do we have to listen to them? Um, Nobody knows. You know, when the Outer Space Treaty was written 50 years ago, the prospect of what if two countries want to explore the same crater, that was a dis, well, that distant future is arriving. Um, one of the things that we're doing with the Artemis diplomacy is we actually have something called the Artemis Accords, which about two dozen countries have signed now, that goes into a little more detail about creating safety zones. It doesn't have like numbers, like you can't claim more than this many miles. But it does say you need to you need to provide real data that shows why do you need that, and you should be for specific time. You know, basically, don't you know the signal that the accord communicates is don't play games with this. You know, be able to demonstrate to the world why you seriously need people to stay away because there's a sensitive. You know, you're going to be blasting something or there's a very sensitive experiment. Um, the Chinese, of course, haven't signed that. So if they land and say, you need to stay away or you will disturb our experiment, or another question, what, what if a country decides to land a mission right next to the Apollo 11 landing site to like take video of it? Or, I mean, a, a question I've actually thrown out to, to my students in a you know kind of humorous essay question. Some country says, we're going to go to the moon and grab one of the American flags and take it home and show it in our national museum. Uh, that would actually be illegal, but what are we, what do you actually do about that? Uh, I had a Jag who acted like, my God, he actually knew the federal laws and international law to talk about what you would do about that. Um, but right now, if China wants to land near one of the Apollo sites and drive their rover back and forth over the footprints, um, it's not clear what the law says about that. I don't think they want to do that. Um, but we're getting to the point where we need to think about some of these issues of how do we share the moon? You know, what, how do you protect, you know, what, what and the Soviets have landers too, that probably they, they wouldn't want somebody messing with, with their, 
uh, old lander. So we, we don't have a good answer to that question yet, but we're gonna have to start thinking about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, what we'll do is we'll take about a five minute break here and we'll come back at 540 for the family discussion group meeting. Thank you very much. And we uh, hope to see you on the 25th for the next session.